The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. The Fold is brought to you by O-Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. Broader scope, tonally, than anything else that was going on in news at the time. And over the, the years to follow, I think that he sort of stayed in that realm and that, you know, he's used different tones, he's approached different kinds of stories, he said this is a story where other people might have said that's just a social media drama and I think he's been proven right by that. Uh, he made this huge jump from making, you know, short stories for TV to making the documentary Tickled, which you know, became a, a huge success and you know, and that level of ambition and a willingness to try something very different has been a hallmark of his. Also, the process of creation is very much in Tickled, and that's a real hallmark of his journalism, is that he takes the audience on the journey in real time as he absorbs a story. And that's not the way we do things as an industry, but I think it's definitely it's a technique that that really has value in terms of the kind of stories that he approaches. Uh, he's also someone who has written for the spin-off for, for a number of years, and he's here to talk about Mr. Organ, his, his film, which uh, debuted last week. And it began as a series of stories on the spin-off that ultimately were a kind of proto-webworm, you know, which is his uh, email and newsletter, where he sort of was recapping some, you know, some internet drama that spilled over into real life or real life drama that spilled over into the internet more to the point and which had an odd character at its centre much like Tickled but this just snowballed in a way that has been pretty extraordinary and honestly kind of debilitating for him like I hope he doesn't mind me saying that he he looks like it's it's taken its toll looks great but it's it's been a load and uh, the the story, look, I won't spoil it for you. It's 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 out in theatres now. You should go see it. But it's based on the Bashford Antique Saga, which a lot of people who read the spin-off back in the day, or who, and many of whom who listen to this podcast, will have read it at the time. It's that, but it's so much more. So we talk about that. We talk a lot about Webworm and just the general process of him figuring out how to do journalism on and about the internet. I think he's a really smart creative, original thinker, and I think anyone who's followed his career will, will get a lot out of this interview. So this is David Farrier on The Fold. Morena, David, welcome to The Fold. It's nice to be here in this room with you, Duncan. It's It's been a long time, it's been a long time, and we actually met, as we were just discussing off mic, like near on 20 years ago. Which is terrifying when you put it in those terms. Yeah, at, at journalism school. I was like, well, prepping for this, I was sort of surveying your career as, as, as the responsible thing to do when you're hosting a show <laughs> and interviewing someone. And I was like, this is a very big, prolific, textured career to look back on for a 65-year-old. And yet right. you're not yet 40, Oh, that's nice. Yeah, I turn 40 on Christmas Day. You do? Ooh. So my question is, are you okay? Because it seems like you've done a bit too much for a very I'm long okay. time. I feel, I looked at myself in the mirror this morning because I'm growing my hair for the first time ever. This is the longest it's ever been. It's shaggy. It's shaggy. And I just saw, well, he looks like, he looks stressed. He's got grey going on. He's frazzled. Um, I feel a bit stressed sometimes. I feel stressed at the moment because I'm in the middle of Mr. Organ and that's just been a weird journey. But generally I feel okay. I have a very simple life. I have no partner, no children, no pets. It's very sad. It sounds very sad when I say it like that. But I have a very simple life. And so the drama of work stuff and the things I've done, it doesn't feel too bad because I don't have other crazy drama going on in my personal life, if that makes sense. It, it does. It almost feels like 
it's only possible if you can have this almost monk-like devotion yep. to your thing. Totally. So I want to start at the start because, you know, when you first emerged on TV, it, it felt like you had like this really specific style. And that's not particularly common for from reporters is that they are encouraged to conform to a kind of a house style. And you were mm. like, I'm just going to be doing David Ferrier stuff. Mm. What, what influenced that? It was... I had a really amazing producer, Rebecca Singh, when I first started. So I started in the newsroom running scripts and running the audio cue machine while I was still, I was in my second year of university at AUT, where I'd meet you the following year. And while I was doing that, the producer on Nightline, I sort of, I can't remember how it happened, but I think I approached her and was like, I'd love to do a story about this thing. And she was just really open to it. And so she I wasn't, I hadn't graduated. I didn't work there doing that job, but she let me put together a couple of stories and she just let me be myself in a way. And then when I left AUT, I got a job in the newsroom pretty quickly on Nightline. And there was a producer, Angus Gillies, who also was a lot like Rebecca and that he just let me do my thing and was super open. And that's kind of what it was back then. TV3 is still kind of a bit renegade and they let people go and do sort of, I think that's how Paddy Gower's turned into Paddy Gower. That couldn't have happened at TVNZ, I don't think. But they let me do that and they let me sort of be free. There was conflict in there. There were a, a number of people I worked with who didn't want me to sort of involve myself in the story or there was a cameraman. He was sort of very old and grisly, very good cameraman. But he refused to shoot back cuts one time in an interview. He was like, this isn't about you, David. It's not about you. And I wasn't confident. And I just sort of took that all on board. I was like, yeah, no, that's right. Journalism, it's not about the reporter. It's about who the story is about. But the conflict with me is that so many of my stories were conversations with, you know, I worked in arts and entertainment. So they're either entertainers or I was generally moving into sort of quirky stuff. And the conversation is part of the story, like the question is part of the story and the dynamic. And so that kind of messed my brain up for a while, that cameraman being like, you must not be in it. And it took a while to like push back against that and eventually land on whatever my style was, which I'm still not quite sure what it was. I mean, the, the thing that's interesting to me is that, that that idea of, you know, just the facts, ma'am kind of thing is very deep and, and still kind of embedded in journalism. But I think what part of the reason you've been so successful is that yes, you've on some level inserted yourself into the story and you know, we'll, we'll talk about Mr. Organ, which is a, a sort of like apex version of that in a way, but also it's about making it interesting and entertaining for people with options. You know, I think you could just assume historically that attention was a given because, you know, it's there's one daily newspaper, you know? Mm. So, and I think that that, that sort of insight is, is something that journalism is still kind of grappling with, like the, the fact that we don't own attention as of right. Yep. But w one thing that, that sort of felt like, you know, because when you moved on to Nightline, mm. that, that show, in terms of its sensibility, it felt like it was quite predictive of where news would go. It was much more personality-based, mm. had narratives, had a yep. sense of humour about it. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful thing about it was that it was – this was when TV3 was the channel for young people because young people had to watch <laughs> TV. And <laughs> yeah. and there's a, a slightly tr kind of tragic quality when you think about that now because that it feels like rather than shutting down Nightline, if you'd really leaned hard into making that a digital product, we might be in a different position now. But I think mm. the big media companies just sort of struggled to understand how, how to relate to the internet. I mean, yeah. what was your sort of experience of Nightline and how, how much did that end up informing the way that your careers developed? Oh, like, I think a lot. I mean, Nightline, that late night news was the one place where you could play loose with the rules. And it almost, I think, it did sort of end up dropping off. And I think they replaced it with the Paul Henry show and then a sort of more generic late night news show. And eventually, I don't even know what exists in that slot right now. But it's... It almost existed separate to the newsroom. We barely, we just existed in our own little unit. You know, I'd arrive at work at 2 p.m. and you wouldn't interact all that much with the news team. You were just in your nightline land and like la la land, you'd just go and do your own thing, which was so wonderful. But I, oh my goodness, I've forgotten your question. 
Well, it's basically about what what how much nightline informed your yeah your yeah career. Yeah. It, I think a lot because it let me focus on stories that most places would tell you weren't a story, and I feel like a lot of my work could very easily be shut down quite early with this isn't a story when I believe it is a story and it should be seen. And I think Nightline let those stories go to air that in a traditional format would never be approved by a producer. And that let me learn how to tell those stories. It was still a big learning curve going and making tickled from doing the news was a huge learning curve because you're sort of inverting the storytelling formula. We're still on Nightline you're starting to get away from that narrative of like top loading with the facts and then sort of going in that inverted pyramid structure. But particularly in long form storytelling, you're holding some information back and you're, you're playing with information in a really different way. And I dabbled a bit with that on Nightline, but it was still a big learning curve when that became my sort of full-time thing. Yeah. I wanted to, to ask about that because there, there seem to be two things happened at the same time. One is that you started to chafe at the, natural constrictions of the format in mm. a way and started to pull on strings of stories that were just bigger than a sort yep. of two to four minute um, TV segment. And that at the same time, you started getting really interested in internet culture and especially the sort of ways that it was kind of warping things at the edges. Yeah. What- yeah, Facebook and Twitter and all these things were coming into the conversation and that just didn't really fit into the traditional sort of News format in still any way. really hard for news to report on oh, social media. Still things. awkward when they're putting up tweets on screen and you've got a presenter sort of reading them out and <laughs> trying to comment on them. But I, I liked the idea, and I also became, you know, I did Nightline for a while, but then I had a period at TV Three where I'd sort of roam around different shows, and the idea was that I'd sort of kind of like Paddy Gower's model now. I'd deliver stories to where they best fitted, so. I could deliver something to Campbell Live or Nightline or the 6 o'clock news. And part of that was having a blog on the 3 News website, which at the time everyone else was kind of like, no, we want to get the lead story on the 6 p.m. news. Mm. Whereas I was really intrigued by being able to write about stuff. And I reminded me of how good writing could be. And that's where Tickled started. It was me blogging about this story for the 3 News, what it was called at the time, website. And Tickled was like a three-part story that I published, and I would embed tweets in that and started that thing of writing about something but bringing in the social media aspects to the writing, which is what I ended up doing a lot here at the spinoff. A lot of my stories would be a narrative unfolding in real time with all the social media and real-world stuff sort of feeding in as I went. Yeah, I wanted to – there's sort of two parts of that that I wanted to drill into a bit. One is like the development of your kind of voice and style – in the written form, which I still think is really distinctive and original, where you you're basically bringing the the reporting almost happens in real time within the story. Like it's <laughs> yeah. the narrative is as it was unfilled to you, yeah. And that's quite different from the sort of more you know a, a traditional approach to feature writing. But I think, and that has been something that I think has become a hallmark of yours. And I think it's part of why people uh, find your work so engaging is that. It, you know, that they're with you on the journey. Yeah, it's still quite, happening. It's yeah. not like here's a bit of history and from last week, and you can read about it. It's like you're reading that story, and it's like you're in my head as it unfolds, and you're going on the journey with me. That's completely what I try and do. And like in a similar way to to you know your your grizzled old cameraman telling you that that's not the way it's done. Have you had kind of blowback from people who are like, you know, this is. <laughs> you're you're, yeah, you're some, doing it wrong. Yeah, some people, since I started with Webworm, which I send out to subscribers, I get some, it's stopped now, but I got some really funny feedback from that. People that were just really angry it wasn't the New York Times. like, And I just would go back to them. I'm like, this is an email newsletter. It's like, you're getting an email from me. It's not the New York Times. Some people find it really affronting when I might swear in a story or something like that. Because I'm bringing... The newsletter is, is bringing more of my personality into things because I think that's what's so interesting about that format. But yeah, I think anything anything you do that's a bit different, some people will be sort of shocked and will tell you, no, do it the old way, do it the old way. But the old way is usually the dying way and it seems like a bad way to go. Yeah, and I think if you're trying to bring – like the New York Times it exists and hopefully always will – 
to mm. deliver a very specific product to, uh-huh. to a specific audience. But I think, well, yeah, like, like, and I talk about this quite a lot in this podcast is that news has a problem in that it, it's, it's not relevant to to a whole bunch of people, and it, yeah. the, it, it's stylistic conventions alienate people, particularly younger people. And we're going to need to try a whole bunch of things. That's oh, one completely. of the things we can do with the internet is make a whole bunch of different products that serve different functions for different audiences. And that's one of the things that Webworm and and your career in general is just absolutely illustrative. And of. I and I think part of what informed Webworm was I would be telling stories on Twitter and giant Twitter threads and, you know, thread one of 30 and I was doing these kind of things and people were engaging with them and retweeting them and clearly liked. And those are all stories that were unfolding in real time. And I thought, why am I giving this away on this someone else's platform when I could be... Jack Dorsey. Yeah, like, that's crazy. Like, so I was like, I'm just going to, why is that 30 piece Twitter thread, not a one written piece. And that was a big, it still is a big mentality behind Webworm is like make it feel like an alive Twitter thread that's happening in real time. It's something that's happening now. And yeah, that I don't know what came first, but that's reflected in the documentary stuff I've done where Tickled, you're, you're writing in the present tense, like it's happening mm. with you. And it's the same with Mr. Organ. It's all happening in the present tense and the story's not finished. Like the whole idea that, you can only report on something sort of when the story's done and it has that end kind of conclusion that, that's sort of wrapped up. I think it's stupid because it's real like it's real life isn't like that. And I think being open ended about things is part of the joy in it all because you're still when you're reading, you realise, oh no, this is still happening. This is current and you care more as a reader, I think, or a viewer. And having the end not resolved, well that's why sports and reality TV and these other formats are, yeah, remain... They're pretty popular, right? ...compelling to people, right? And, uh-huh. and I think we can learn from all that. Another story I want to talk about, a, a spin-off story, because there was a period when you wrote for us very regularly mm. and uh, was was called Hello, My Name is Ali, which was about a mm. YouTube subculture that you found. I and mean, this is in 2016, and I was reading Scott Galloway recently who talked about you know that, that term of big tech and, and, the, the, and the idea that... The technology companies didn't weren't just this unalloyed social good, and in fact, weren't really paying attention to what was happening on their platforms, and were just you know printing money and, and didn't really have society's best interests at hmm. at heart. I feel like you are very early on that. So, do you want to tell us about that story and what it sort of revealed to you about the relationship with, between the platforms and their audiences? Yeah, I mean, that was a story that was just hiding in plain sight where. Uh, you had these, it was around the time of challenges, you know, the ice bucket challenge, you know, this big popular thing was putting out a challenge and you record yourself doing it. And yeah, I noticed these videos. I honestly don't remember how I got to this. Someone would have told me about it. They would have said, look at this weird video um, or it popped up in my feed. Uh, these videos of the challenge being, um, hey, kids, like I want to see you like walk on Lego pieces and see how that feels like film it film the reaction because walking on legos sore so you know they'd done this and a bunch of other videos and kids were doing the same thing and viewed individually these were just a bunch of random clips of kids standing on lego going ouch and for whatever reason other kids may be watching it and finding it funny but started finding these playlists that were just nothing but kids crushing things and standing on things and that just being clearly like fetish material in plain sight. And, you know, YouTube did not care at all. It, 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 it had no kind of way of dealing with playlists and the kind of content that was being created. And, you know, the idea of, you know, YouTube is full of children, like that's a big part of their revenue. Of course, there's going to be adults on there that go and exploit that. They've got access to like, millions and millions of children. Of course, adults will get on there and be horrific. And that was happening and it was in plain sight. No one was talking about it uh, in any kind of major way. And so that's what that story was about. And, you know, YouTube took action once the story was out and it was being retweeted and people were sharing it. And I got an idea of the power of that kind of writing. If you can put this into the world and kind of report on it in a really clear way, you might be able to affect change. But... There's so much, yeah, that that was frustrating because the idea that unless it had been reported on, nothing would have happened is just so, shows how little these platforms give a shit about anything besides money. Yeah, I mean, I I think they were just genuinely oblivious. So that 
those I'm pretty sure those those videos were, did end up being taken down. That story was by our mm-hmm. standards at the time very big and would periodically pop up again. I think it yep. would be cited as this sort of early example of some of the mm. you know bad unintended consequences of just having free yeah. reign to UGC. Yeah. Just a lot of bad actors that yeah weren't known about at the time. I mean, as someone who's reported on this stuff a lot for for a number of years, do you is there a solve? Like, because uh, I'm always curious about this. Like, it seems very bizarre to me that, for example, like the the biggest platform in the world right now, we have no visibility over it. It's effectively controlled by the Chinese government, and increasingly <laughs> people get all their news from it. And mm. yet we have no, there is no mechanism to verify any of that. And and it's just our youngest people are basically learning how to understand the world through a platform that <laughs> has all of these kind of dynamics at play. Uh-huh. And I'm trying not to be a weird old grouch about it because it's very compelling, but it also seems incredibly dangerous. And I'm wondering if you consider the policy side or or if there's any kind of strong feeling in you about what can be done about all of this mess? Oh, I think nothing I, – look, I, I, I'm not well versed on these big questions because I just don't know. I'm very stunned by it all and I don't know what the answer is besides – the really basic idea of if you have children, it's part of your responsibility to kind of educate them and how to process information because, yeah, we're living in a time obviously when people are just glued to their phones primarily and they're getting information and the information they're getting, thanks to platforms like TikTok, is pretty they're sort of fast and loose with the facts. And I think there's no way, you know, the, the platforms are never going to care about what's accurate and what's not. They just That's never going to happen. So we're just living in a time when there's bad information everywhere and you've somehow got to just raise your children to somehow know the difference between or have slightly uh, objective sort of thinking about what they're seeing. It just seems impossible. I know this, I'm speaking as a parent to, to three young women, like I find it, it's very easy to watch something and find it very compelling and then just sort of almost absentmindedly, oh, I wonder if that's true. And then you look into it and it's yep. no, I mean, half living, of it is I mean, and half of it isn't. And you're like, oh, I'm not really sure how you can expect like a 13-year-old to possibly have, the, you know, even run a fact check. Yeah, it's just because it's just clutter. Like everything yeah. is clutter. But and I mean, the but also, it, right? this is, it is the pace. But, you know, Hayden Donnell wrote a piece for Webroom today about, I think it was titled, like, The World is Run by Con Men. And a thing he mentioned of that is, you know that guy, um, Leonardo DiCaprio, DiCaprio played him, that con man who um, flew the plane. Catch, he me, was, if catch me if you can. You know, I just learned this in Hayden's piece, but there's this idea that that con man once piloted a plane and flew a plane. Never happened. That's just been misinformation that's been flying around forever. He had a pilot ID and he pretended to be a pilot. He never flew a plane. But that was just this known information. And I feel like... That's what we have on TikTok everywhere now is, yeah, kids will watch something. And, you know, it's sort of an, it's presented in an entertaining way, like what a fun fact. And you'll just go around believing that stuff, right? You don't have time to critically check it. Like I never critically checked the fact that that con man never flew a plane. So I look, I don't know. I think we're living in really crazy times where increasingly the people that are running the worlds are people who just kind of make up their own version of reality and just run with it and it works really well. Like and it works you, well for Musk, worked well for Trump. And if you've got a sort of an audience that's kind of comfortable with that or at yeah. least is living in the same kind of made reality, then... Yeah, it's just something we're in. It's, it's really... It would be weird not to. You know? Yeah, it would be weird not to, right? I don't know what the answer is. I feel like... I, yeah, I, I I find it all pretty bleak. Like I, I I think information is just lost to us now, and I don't know how we try and fight to keep it on track. I mean, I yeah, it's awful. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> yeah, tend tend to agree. The really struggle to be an optimist in this area, even though I think I'm wired that way. So so talking about webworm, it's you know it, it was started as. Your your own thing and is now on its way to to becoming a publication. Uh, you know, as in multiple authors regularly writing. Um, how do you how do you sort of juggle? Because it, it, it also feels like you are a very natural substacker, mm. uh, and and that Webworm is must be considered one of the more kind of interesting emblematic projects of the what is still a very nascent platform, mm. albeit one that's starting to evolve in terms of 
you know, the community and distribution side in really interesting ways, I think, over mm. the past six months. But, um, you know, h- how do you sort of juggle the voracious appetite of a thing that must continue to go out with these giant, unwieldy projects that, never, you know, the fast and slow of all that? Yeah, it feels like S- Substack for me in writing WebRoom feels like a holiday from the bigger stuff. And I really, like, I genu- genuinely like writing it. And I mean, something, a decision I made when I, when I started Substack a couple of years ago, someone said, you should have like a regular publishing thing Like you should publish at 8 a.m. on a Monday and you should do another thing on Wednesday and another thing on Saturday or something. And I was like, that will never work. It needs to be when I feel the urge to write something and not be under that pressure of a certain day or a certain time. Because once an audience is expecting a thing on a certain day, you are locked in, and that's when you're in hell because it's like, oh, every Monday I have to have this thing ready. So I very specifically wanted to make it feel like a surprise when it would be sent out. And that just naturally works for me because I'm only sending stuff when I find something that's interesting to write about. And just so far for the last two years, stuff just happens. I find stuff, and I'm always on the internet and people are always sending me little tips on things and I write quickly and it's not hard for me to write. It's hard for me to get my spelling and grammar correct all the time. That's the main thing I'm atrocious at. Um, But it's just fun and I like writing it. I'm, I'm super engaged. And like I said earlier, I don't have like five kids wanting me to wanting my attention. I don't have a dog I'm walking. So that's like a fun place to write on there. And I love it. Whereas the bigger projects are just kind of happening in the background. And, you know, for instance, this morning, I wasn't going to publish a newsletter, but I woke up a bit early because I'm jet lagged. I was up at five. Hayden Donnell had sent me a piece about con men. I was going to publish it later, but I thought, oh, I'll just put it up today. And so I got up, I wrote some intros, I did an edit, and I just sent it out. And that's my newsletter done for the week. You know, so it's, it's super organic. There's no plan. That's that's good that it will yeah and and I think that there was that idea when Substack first started that you had to that there was a specific way to do it when it mm. feels like as with most things there's actually a whole bunch yeah of I'll, different... I'll send out sort of two to three a week and if I keep on track with that roughly I'm happy and I've just happily kept up with that pace in the last two years and it seems to work. Do you do you miss the sort of scale and camaraderie of a? Of a bigger media organization, or, or are oh. you sort of sort of building that within with, with the with the likes of Hayden and no, Dylan don't want to so build don't want to build it. I miss a newsroom because newsrooms are the best places in the world because you're just in the middle of so much information and it's in real time and it's there's no better atmosphere than people yelling about some latest story that they're working on and it's just like being in a candy store. The great thing about working on your own publication is that it's all at your own pace and it's away from that yelling and craziness. And that's also really good. I'm not trying to replicate that with what Webworm is with like building up a team of writers. That's more just people I admire. And when it fits, it gives me a day off from writing something and it opens up, I think what Webworm can be, but it's not, I'm never, I would never make Webworm into a sort of a, a bigger wide team of a newsroom. It's, I think it's got to be, me being interested and pushing into things that I'm interested in. That's sort of what people seem to like from it. Do you want to tell me now about the Arise story, which Mm. almost borderline outside of scope in some respects in terms of what the the kind of conception of Webworm is, but really, Mm. but also maybe one of the most impactful and vital things you've, you've ever worked on. Like how, how, how did that sort of work for you? Because it just mm. felt like it became this quite quite enormous and yeah and thing that was very important to you to to kind of see through. Yeah, well, I mean, that was interesting because I think that probably, you know, I was surprised at how big that got because it ended up being on other media outlets and it had an impact in that way. I... It was a much more traditional piece of journalism, I suppose. So on Webworm, I'll generally speak in a certain tone and I'll swear sometimes and I'll be humorous, whereas this was a story that I've been looking into for about six months prior to writing anything about it, just trying to get the pieces in place. 
And then a few key things did come along and a few key sort of witnesses that would go on the record and that's when everything else sort of came to the front. But I just understood that that had to be rewritten in a more traditional way. Uh, and I realized that it was a big story and I had to just be very careful. So, you know, thanks to paying subscribers, I could get a lawyer to look over everything because I realized I was going up against an organization that has a lot of tithing money, which equates to millions and millions of dollars. So I had to be a bit more serious about it. And the way the newsletter format worked with that is that megachurches are such a confusing world to explain to someone that isn't part of it because it's like, it's very cult-like. But if I was going to try and land that story in one written article on a news website or a newspaper, it would be impossible. So what the newsletter format let me do and what I learned it could do is that you can start to just lay the groundwork. So the first piece about Arise was just basically, it's not just Destiny Church that's problematic. There's a bunch of like giant white churches that we're just not talking about. And it was really basic. It was just some big ideas thrown out. And then from there, that sort of laid down the groundwork. You know, people reading that were like, oh, there are these churches we've never heard of. That's a bit weird. And then the next article was about interns being abused at Arise. And it was just all about the interns. The next piece was like, oh, the sexual assault was covered up. That's what this is about. This, And so different installations of that story would just build and build and build. And I think that story would have been really hard to tell and follow in a traditional news format. It just sort of naturally lends itself to serialization, both the format and the nature of that story itself. Yeah because it would start to feed on And you can just build and build and build. And as you write more, you hear from more people and it gets back into what you were talking about where the story is kind of unfolding in real time. You know, suddenly I've got these weird interactions and emails from them. Um, people are resigning and it just becomes alive and starts kind of feeding itself. I read an interview with you recently where you talked and you were not thrilled with the level of attribution that went on and <laughs> from, yeah, better from, days came out uh, yeah, from, better. from other media towards it. Do you want to talk about that? Cause that feels like a, basically like a, a long running plague of the media is that it's very important to pretend that there is no other media and, oh, in New Zealand, especially. Yeah, no, yeah. It, it is. Well, I mean, I think it has been a thing internationally, but they, they, maybe they've had some kind of, you know, got in a room together and had a treaty where they yeah. acknowledge reality, but that doesn't yeah. always seem to be the case here. No, there's this weird fear in New Zealand where the idea of if you mention a writer you like or another piece, that the person reading your story is going to immediately abandon you and sort of become a dedicated reader of this thing you've linked to. I think that's this fear, and it's like the thing that was frustrating about the Arise story to me was that I reported that this – shitty stuff was happening with interns. And so Arise Church started a review. And other media came in and started reporting on that. But their story started with the fact, oh, out of nowhere, Arise has started a review into this bad stuff that's going on. And so not only is it not crediting me, the main problem was it's missing out a really key part of the story. This church didn't wake up one morning and sort of go, oh, I think today we're going to probably review our practices. They might be bad. They didn't just suddenly think of that. They didn't sort of get guilt ridden all of a sudden. It was because of months of me giving them shit. And it's like it frustrated me that in not crediting Webworm, they were also just not telling a really key part of the story. But it started going on and almost became comical because it was like they were really actively doing backflips to avoid naming. Maybe it's because Webworm is quite a silly word. Like just saying Webworm, like you're not quoting CNN or, I don't know, Fox News or something. I don't know, Webworm. Is that, was that why? It was weird. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I look, speaking as someone who runs an organization that has had a similar kind of complaint at various times, <laughs> I, I do think that there is a bit of a – there can be an attitude towards new things from things which have been around longer that, you know – you're not real. Like they're the real yeah. ones reporting on it. You were kind of blog, and people would often like write. Oh, he's just like it's a blog. It's on a blog. And yeah, like that sort of uses it away. Whenever anyone it feels calls, it feels dismissive. Right? Yeah, but until it's on the six o'clock news, it's almost like it's not real. And and also we would, you know, not to make it all about my, no, my um, <laughs> furies as well. That that they you know we would break what felt like a very significant story and said in other outlets, which who would normally cover a much smaller version of that, wouldn't follow it because, you know, it, it had come from this sort of less yeah you know, interesting place. And look, 
we all have. I mean, I'm sure that there are there are many critiques you could make of of the spin off and its style as well. So I, I won't dwell on that. But I, I do think that overall, as an industry, we could do a much better job of being realistic and just acknowledging the great and very hard work it yeah, is to and, break and, stories. And more people are calling it out, and I think it is changing. I think increasingly people are sort of you know, as my reporting went on, and I sort of moaned about it a few times. I did start getting mentioned and then occasionally even linked to, which is like a Christmas miracle. I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. Um, I think people are attributing more. And it's like, it goes both ways. You know, if you attribute to someone else, they can attribute back to you. And like, there's nothing I like more in WebRim than like linking to, you know, there are a number of stories out to arise that I think RNZ did one and maybe stuff about a completely different church, completely fresh story. There's nothing I love more than WebRim than saying, I'll go and read this and this, because this is amazing. This is all happening in the same world. I'm not going to lose a WebRim reader because they've clicked on a link to another story. They're not going to go and cancel a subscription because stuff's written this thing. It's like we're informing each other of really important work, and why would we not? It just, it, it, on some level, feels like it just does hark back to an era when you really were either a TV3 person or a TVNZ person at 6 it's a battle. Yeah. And, and that is still sort of in the, the Deeply. DNA. Yeah, I mean, I remember times in like the newsroom at TV3 where the programs would fight amongst each other for stories and try and be secretive about well, things. And that still goes on. You know, I've heard yeah. stories about checkpoint versus morning report, for example. <laughs> and you still yeah. sit now in ways that like are objectively funny, like News Hub <laughs> will have a poll and then – at like seven minutes in, TVNZ will say, there's been a new poll, and they'll just put out the results. Yeah. It's the same thing. The poll just appeared yeah. like, like in the night like sky. Magic. Yeah. yeah, like magic. And I think it's it's fun that we're in New Zealand that's so small. You can kind of track this stuff all at once. If you're aware of it, it can be really fun to see like how that's happening in real time. The Fold is brought to you by O-Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa, with over 4,000 out-of-home advertising sites nationwide across both street furniture and retail centres. I'm super grateful to O-Media for enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. Skinny are helping you show how smart you are with the 1Q Quiz, an all-new, super-challenging and super-quick daily quiz built by The Spin-Off. Every Monday, Skinny are giving you the chance to prove you're smart with the Skinny Extra Credit question. Get it right, and you'll get the chance to score yourself some Skinny Extra mobile credit so you can text, call, or even video call your group chat and gloat about how big your brain is. T's and C's apply. Raising capital or taking your business to the world? Investment Fix has the lowdown on everything you need to make it happen. This season, we're exploring the US market the opportunities it offers, what it takes to grow a business there, and the best way to approach investors. Join some of the superstars of the investment and business world as they share advice from their time in the US so you can make your mahi count in this massive market. The Investment Fix Podcast, brought to you by Invest New Zealand. Tune in today. So we're here ultimately to talk about Mr. Organ, which honestly I've been kind of... Delaying because I read uh, Chris Schultz's interview uh, with you on the, the spin-off over the weekend, and you, you know, you and, and I quote described yourself as fucks, <laughs> um, and and really seemed to mean it. Yeah, um, and so yeah, so I don't want to dwell on on this clearly hyper traumatic. Uh, you know, no, movie, you're all movie good. too much. You're all good. But I went back and reread the Bashford saga that, that you wrote for us, and and the first piece I'd sort of forgotten how kind of innocent and just like here's a funny thing on the internet, like yeah. we're almost like quite a webwormy pre webworm beginning recapping some it media. Completely, it completely was story of a colleague's misfortune, an odd fellow, you know, but. But obviously it became quite a lot more than that. Mm. How does this compare to a tickled or an arise? Like like is is this the worst? Yeah, by far. Yeah, this was it was bad because Mr. Organ, you know, I this was it had all the hallmarks that tickled had, where it had like an intriguing, very light premise about a car clamper who was charging seven hundred dollars to, you know, remove a car clamp who was apparently also a prince, had this like weird stuff. Mm. And it did what Tickle did. And I knew at the beginning when I'd done a bit of research that it was going to go somewhere quite sort of dark and different. What I didn't know is that it would just take me, it was like five years from when I started writing about it on the spinoff to 
getting the movie finished. And it just took way longer. I wanted it done in two years, but it just went on for three years because the subject of the documentary is, is just impossible. I describe him as a black hole at one point, and I think that's the best way. And it's hard to explain, but the whole film is about sort of manipulation and the truth and getting sucked into someone else's orbit. And, you know, going in, like everyone was like, oh, I hope it doesn't happen to you kind of thing. And I was like, ha, ha, ha. But then it sort of did. And that's, it just fucked my brain up. Like I, you know, I was, I caught up since I've been back. I've been talking to Dom who shot it and Dan who cut it. And Dan, Dave, Dom, it's a good little trio of people. Uh, and yeah, I was just saying to them, I, I really did come undone during that time. Like I was doing bad directing at times. Like I was sitting in the edit just not knowing what was going on because my brain was so cluttered. And I mean, I left New Zealand to get away from this, like Mr. Organ. Like the second I realized I could go, I went. And so, yeah, it was horrible. I hated it. But I'm really glad it's done because it's kind of funny and weird. And I, I think people are like watching it. Except like, is it done? Oh, no, it's not. There's, like, I mean, his kids. <laughs> kind of a genius like it almost feels like he's creating a new ending in in real time or, and you know which which a similar thing happened with with tickled right like uh, you know you write about some of that that stuff on the spinoff as well where david damato would just sort of appear mm. and uh you know that's that's almost the nature of these projects but it doesn't feel like he's done with you yet which must be quite a horrifying thought it feels like, yeah, it, the weird thing being back here is, yeah, this knowledge that he isn't done with me. I mean, we're out in about 60 theatres and he's been calling some of those theatres, sort of telling them in various ways not to play the film. And there's other weird stuff going on that I don't know is linked to this or not. And it's it's just, yeah, Mr. Organ hasn't, you know, this is a documentary like Tickled about someone who's, alive and functioning in society it's not like a lot of the crime docos you see where someone is in prison or they're dead it's like you're dealing with someone who is like very much alive and probably not a fan of mine and so that comes with its problems when you start to put that thing out into the world that they might not be happy with that's yeah an awkward place to be it does it does sound it but uh you know it, it's it's exciting to have it out and um um, I hope that all of the, the chaos actually just gets eyes on the film because uh, it it deserves it. Yeah, if I, I need to I mean, kind of pay you back for all that you went through. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of sort of craziness happening on Twitter and I sort of joked that it's like I've hired a huge marketing team and we've created like the best alternate reality game around and you can take part in it because characters are popping up and it's chaos. But, yeah, it's probably not a game, which is can be annoying. Yeah, in a practical true. sense, it actually does have a lot of those those feels to those early kind of. Oh, totally. Uh, geez. Here's a wacky character. What are they tweeting about? Does it link back to the website? You know. So, so what's next for you? Like, uh, hopefully, some some rest. Oh, know, total rest. No, my growing, growing, out, growing out your hair some more. I'm growing out my hair some more. No, I all I want to do for the next year is write Webroom and do my weekly podcast with Dax and Monica. That's all I want to do. I don't want to think about anything else. I don't want to think about another documentary or anything. I just want to write my newsletter and do my podcast and sleep. Well, I, I hope, <laughs> I fervently hope that you that you get your wish. Uh, thanks so much for coming on the pod, Dave. It's been so good to catch up. No, thank you. And also genuinely, thank you. Like Mr. Organ started with spin-off articles. You let me print about eight in the series. And when I came to you and went, I want to turn this into a film, can I use content that the spin-off owns you were just like oh yeah great go and do it that was great that doesn't happen in life everyone's so possessive and weird so thank you for being like thumbs up go and make your silly film because here we are no i I'm, i i do remember that and i you know I, I i consider it a sort of a weird stepchild of the of the spin-off i like the fact that we're a place that 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 can happen i hope it continues to be the case so no i'm i'm, I'm proud it's a big day for us too fun thanks duncan thanks for coming on dave the Fold was brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network. It was hosted by Duncan Grieve, produced by T.I. Hair Butler, with production management by Rachel Maru and series production by Jane Yee.
That was The Fold, brought to you by our partners at O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. Huge thanks to O Media for sponsoring this episode of The Fold and enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. Kia ora e te iwi, te Ahe Butler here, podcast manager at The Spin-Off. If you enjoy listening to our podcasts, consider supporting our mahi by signing up to become a Spin-Off member at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.